So today is the fourth class of group theory. Uh, do you guys have a, any questions that we can start with first? Um, so can you briefly explain the cos cos space? Right, sure. So coset space. To understand coset space, you first need to understand what a coset is, right? So if you have a group G and H is some subgroup, then we can partition the group, partition the set that is the group into disjoint subsets. And these subsets would be the subgroup H itself, then say G1 H, another co a coset, G2 H, dot, 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 say G K minus one H. So there are K cosets. Okay, so if I uh, look at a pictorial representation of this, you know, this is our group. And uh, so this is G. And the coset construction divides it into little bits. This is a subgroup, but the other ones are not subgroup, but they're sets. Okay. Yes, so, yeah. okay. So the idea here is that the partition is in terms of disjoint subset, okay? There is no overlap. So that means now we can construct a new set. And this new set is usually referred to by G over H. And this set consists of all these individual subsets. So we know that when we are doing set theory, that we can have sets of sets, right? So G over H is a set of sets where each element is a coset. Is that clear, Josh? Yes, sir. So now this, this new set G over H, this set is called a coset space. So it is the space of all the cosets. You know, it's the space of all the cosets under H, okay? So the coset space is in general not a group. Okay, the coset space G over H in general is not a group. But if H is a normal subgroup. What does H being normal subgroup means? It means that if you conjugate an element, well, if you do this act action, so meaning that if you take an element from H and take some G and G inverse, then if you get H prime, which is also in big H. If this is true for all H in H, then, you know, we can say that G of H is equal to say uh, H prime of G, right? So then we call H a normal subgroup. This need not be the case 
for all subgroups. If H is a normal subgroup, you know, then we can introduce a group multiplication, a very natural group multiplication where we take two cosets, say G1, H, and say G2, H, and define the multiplication between them as being the coset that results from G1, G2 of H, okay? And you can verify, and I think this is one of the exercises that I gave that you know, this uh, construction, you know, does make uh, G over H into a group. And that group is called the quotient group. Okay, so this is the uh, coset group or the quotient group. And uh, as an example, we can take the group of all real numbers under addition. And uh, the integers form a normal subgroup of the real numbers. And therefore, you know, uh, you know, uh, we have, you know, we can form a, uh, a quotient group out of that, right? So we can have R over Z. Okay, so, and uh, the other comment I think is relevant for this is that if G is abelian, meaning that all its elements G1 and G2 commute, then any subgroup H is automatically normal because if I have G, H, G inverse, because it's a G is abelian, that means that this is equal to G, G inverse of H, which is H, uh, which satisfies the condition that H is normal. So if you have G abelian, then it's, uh, you know, yeah, it's a normal subgroup. Uh, any subgroup is normal, and therefore there's an automatic way of constructing a coset group. Okay. So yes. I have a question. So yeah. the coset you said disjoint, uh, disjoint coset. So wouldn't they make wouldn't they make space even if they are not disjoint, even if they have overlapping elements? Well, the cosets don't make do not overlap because it's an equivalence relationship, and equivalence relationship will always. Uh, uh, you know, divide a set into disjoint uh, subsets. Also, oh, it's by definition. Yeah. Oh, okay, got like, it. That's another thing I wanted you to, I think, verify. It wasn't an exercise, but I wanted you to convince yourself that when you have a uh, when you have a uh, equivalence relationship, and you on a set that equivalence relationship divides that set into uh, disjoint subsets. Okay. Okay, I think there's a comment. Let's see what the comment is. Okay, so it's about the sound. Okay, any other questions or comments? So you might ask, okay, what is this group? 
right? So I leave that as an exercise. It's an interesting group. And it's a group that we will uh, very often sort of, you know, come across. So, I mean, think of it geometrically. So the real line is, is like this. It's, an, it's a non-compact set. And the integers are a subset. This is, of course, like I am cheating a little bit because all the definitions I gave you were for finite groups, assuming finite groups. And then I tell you about an example where both the group and its subgroup are infinite, right? So um, I'm surprised that no one has caught me out yet. But the idea is that, you know, these ideas spill over to the infinite group. I just, uh, I just used the finite uh, setting to define them because then, you know, I can draw pictures like this. You know, I can draw, draw pictures like this and build up intuition. But this also works if, you know, these things, you know, uh, go all the way to infinity in all directions. And it also works for continuous groups as we shall see. Okay, so R is a continuous group, whereas this guy is a, uh, is a uh, discrete group. They're both infinite. So when you do the quotienting of R over Z, what you're doing is that you're identifying these points, right? You're essentially identifying all these points. And you're identifying any point that is shifted by this amount. So, you know, you're also identifying this point with this point and this point and this point. So uh, can someone tell me? Circle. I don't want to, it's a circle, exactly. So it'll look like a circle. So you immediately know that the circle is going to be some sort of a group. Now, the exercise I want to give you, and it's a fun exercise, so it's not, it's not gonna be a blue exercise, so, because, uh, but, you know, I would recommend that you do it. It's very highly recommended, is that, you know, find the group operation you know, on the circle. Okay, so uh, so you you are actually kind of discovering a new group, very interesting group that has lots of applications in physics, as well as mathematics. Okay, so that's kind of our review of uh, Sir, the question. Question. Yes. Uh, so uh, how do we say that it's a circle? So I wasn't quite clear with. Topologically, you know, how, what does it look like? Uh, well, there are many identifications. So if there was just one identification, I would have, I would have included that. Oh, I mean, you know, you are, you are uh, saying that, you know, when I go from here, sorry, when I go from say here to here, I, I end up here again. Right, that's basically what it, what this identification is, is doing. Think about oh, it for a minute, and you'll is it that's... like a, a circle with the many windings, for example? No, it's just a circle. Okay. Uh, it's a line with, you know, where you have kind of, you know, so. This red point is mapped, all the red points map to one red point here, okay. All the blue points map to say a blue point here. And suppose that, you know, so on and so forth. You have in the middle, you have some pink points. Okay, and the pink point, you know, would be, would all the pink points would map here, right? So thinking about it in that way, 
uh, you can convince yourself that this is going to be a circle. Okay. Okay, any more questions? Okay, we have uh, Otoni saying, uh, there is an isomorphism vision of Z to S1 at Nahi, okay. Well, that's basically what we're doing here, right? Yeah. Uh, all right, so, but I want you to discover the group multiplication for this new group, okay?